The Autism Research Institute relies on the generosity of donors like you to make this webcast possible. If you enjoy this presentation, please consider making a donation. Thank you. Dr. Manuel Casanova is a neurologist with extensive experience in neuropathology and research. He is currently the Smart State Chair in Childhood Neurotherapeutics and Professor of Biomedical Sciences at the University of South Carolina Greenville Health System. These webinars are made possible through generous donor support, including a grant from Local 25 Boston Teamsters. If you'd like to contribute, please visit our website at autism.com. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Casanova. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction, Denise. Actually, uh, I'm remembering um, a story about what happened in INSAR, the International Meeting for uh, um, Autism Research, when uh, Declan Murphy was the plenary uh, speaker, and he talked about autism treatments, saying that, quote unquote, there were no effective or adequate treatments. And uh, what he meant by that was the fact that uh, treatments tend to be symptomatic. They are Band-Aid approaches. Uh, they do not target the pathology, and as such, at the end of the day, week or month, the person is still autistic and with the same risk factors to develop the symptomatology. In some cases, like uh, uh, in the case of neuroleptics, uh, side effects may actually be quite significant and even worse than the original symptoms that needed the treatment. So for us to develop an effective way of uh, intervening in the condition, we really need to know what is happening in the brains of autistic individuals. So I will start by explaining the whys of transcranial magnetic stimulation in autism, how we target the pathology of the condition. And I will have to go back to a little bit of a theory in terms of uh, brain development. Now, if you're able to focus your attention here on the uh, middle panel of this illustration, it's actually a coronal section, a section through the early developing brain going from uh, the surface of the brain in here all the way to the core of the brain. You will see that in the core of the brain, there is a cavity, which we call ventricle. It's filled with fluid. And surrounding the same, you have this flossy blanket. It's um, actually standing for cells. They are stem cells. They divide. And uh, then they migrate towards the developing cortical plate, what is going to become the uh, cerebral cortex. These cells that migrate uh, radially uh, to the cerebral cortex, they will mature and develop into excitatory cells. There's another stream of migration in here stemming from the ganglionic eminence, the lateral and the medial ganglionic eminences. And you see that they go towards the cortex following a tangential uh, migration. These cells are going to mature and they will develop into inhibitory neurons. And they have to get together with the excitatory neurons to actually establish the excitatory inhibitory bias of the cortex. When they come together, they form structures that are called mini columns. Mini columns are like the microprocessors of uh, the brain. They are uh, the structures responsible for parallel processing within the brain. There's a lot of evidence within the literature suggesting that these mini columns are abnormal in patients with autism. And uh, a long time ago, a person by the name of Theodore Maynard, uh, sometime in the uh, late 1800s, he actually said that many psychiatric conditions were the result of abnormalities in how the brain was structured, how it developed. And from there on, the analogy has been created of brain development like a ballet. Uh, sometimes you get a change and, and it's like a ballerina that takes a new leap and, and it's welcomed like um, a, a, a work of genius, a high creativity. But sometimes the same ballerina may actually take a leap and land in its face or her face. 
And uh, neurodevelopmental conditions are something that happens during brain development, and, and they may span this gamut from uh, being a work of art and, and ingenuity uh, to actually falling flat on your face. Now, a long time ago, I remember that uh, there was a very distinguished um, uh, Canadian neuropathologist and neurologist. He wrote one of my favorite uh, medical textbooks about pediatric neurology. And he said that uh, neurologists and neuropathologists should be like archaeologists. They should dig into the brain and actually find fingerprints of pathological processes. In the case of migratory abnormalities, he actually suggested that sometimes the fingerprints can be found when the cells that were supposed to be going out of that flossy blanket surrounding the ventricles, they remain behind. Or sometimes they may even get stuck in the white matter. Now, you already know what a hernia is, okay? Um, you know that commonly a hernia is whenever an organ of the body is displaced to a position where it shouldn't be. Uh, those cases are pathological, they are really not normal, they may be painful, they may even require surgery. And the same thing happens uh, with these neurons when they migrate they form nests of cells where they shouldn't be, and they are completely abnormal. In here, we have the MRI of a patient. In here, you see the ventricle and the fluid-filled cavity of the brain. Surrounding it, you see an agglomeration of cells that shouldn't have been there. Sometimes they remain behind as blebs. Uh, they have been described with the appellation of candle gutterings. And uh, they pepper the brain. Uh, this was the occipital ventricle. This is the frontal horn. And uh, they are abnormal. Uh, sometimes the cells in the flossy blanket, they divide and then they move to the uh, white matter. And uh, they get stuck there. They are called heterotopias. Now, there are two things that are very important about these heterotopias. If you examine their content, uh, they are full of large plum cells with very large nucleoli and a lot of uh, uh, nasal substance in them. It means that they are very active and they bear the phenotype of excitatory cells. The problem is that there are no inhibitory cells or very few of them. And when all of your cells in a particular area are excitatory without much to do about inhibition, it procreates a seizure foci. And in many of these cases, it accounts for intractable seizures in some of our autistic patients. The other thing that you have to be aware about heterotopias is that they have been found in variable locations in uh, the brains of autistic individuals. They may be found in the frontal lobe in one case, in the occipital lobe in the next one, and they vary in quantity and severity. And uh, this type of finding has been called environmental heterotopias. There may be a genetic predisposition to this uh, neuronal migratory disorder, but there's something that appears to be environmentally induced on top of it. Sometimes the cells go outside of their flossy blanket, they uh, transverse the whole of the white matter, and they get stuck at the junction of the gray white matter. Okay, and here uh, you see in this panel a cross-section of the cerebral cortex in a controlled individual, a typically developing individual. The surface is over here, the gray-white matter junction is over here. This would be the autistic individual, and these are magnifications in the gray-white matter junction. You can see that there is a clean divide a very sharp one in between the gray matter and the white matter for the typically developing individual. In here, you have the autistic individual, and you see that the cells actually continue to the white matter and cause a fossil border. 
Now, this is of important because um, this finding has actually been reproduced. It's not only in terms of neuropathology. This is a study by uh, Derek Andrews working with uh, Declan Murphy and Christine Eckers, who was the uh, senior author in that publication. And they used magnetic resonance imaging to calculate the gray white matter percentage contrast in the brains of autistic individuals and in controls. And uh, they found that the boundary in between the gray matter and the white matter was effaced. And they attributed the findings to uh, uh, this uh, neuronal population getting stuck there. Once uh, the cells migrate and they haven't gotten stuck in the flossy blanket, in the white matter, or in the gray white matter junction, they arrive to the uh, cerebral cortex and they form abnormal mini columns. In here, you will see in this panel uh, a normal control. In here, you see the autistic individuals. The bluish stain denotes the cells. They tend to acquire um, a radial orientation, um, which actually defines the presence of mini columns. And if you examine the magnification of the control and the autistic individuals, you will see that there are many more mini columns than normal in the autistic individual. This finding has been reproduced by other individuals, other laboratories, and also by using other techniques. This is uh, using the grade level index. In here, we were using something called the Euclidean minimum spanning tree. And in here, this was a technique which was actually developed for the World Health Organization when they were trying to computerize a brain atlas for uh, humans. Uh, it was developed in Carl Seeley's laboratory in Germany. Uh, but the main thing is that using different techniques, uh, using different populations and different laboratories, they have been able to reproduce these findings and they are abnormal. Now, a long time ago, uh, Janos Stefan Gotha, a very famous Hungarian neuroanatomist, he depicted the organization of the cerebral cortex. And here, you can actually see how he described the columnar arrangement of cells. And, and in here, in the middle compartment, in the circular compartment, you have some cells that are transparent. And transparent cells denoted excitatory cells. Otherwise, there are some blackened cells, some neurons that are dark in the periphery. And those are the interneurons, the inhibitory uh, neurons. He called this a position of excitatory cells in the middle surrounded by inhibitory cells as a shower curtain of inhibition. When we compartmentalize the mini column in autistic individuals, we'll see that um, mini columns are smaller in autistic individuals, but a lot of the pathology, a lot of the abnormality comes from the neuropil space which is this space in the periphery where the inhibitory cells are located. If we were to actually measure this compartment throughout the length of the cerebral cortex, you will see that it's present in all layers of the cerebral cortex. It's something that involves a common anatomical element throughout the whole cerebral cortex. And we believe that's highly suggestive of an inhibitory deficit. Uh, this uh, deficit is not found everywhere within the cortex. It's, it's actually peppered across the cerebral cortex. And it's very reminiscent also of the heterotopias. It is actually suggestive that if there's a hereditary or genetic predisposition, there's also something environmental going on in uh, these brains. Now, remember the drawing by uh, Janos Sefengothai, who actually called the uh, disposition of inhibitory cells surrounding the mini column as a shower curtain of inhibition. Now, you know that a shower curtain keeps water inside of the bathtub. If you have a defective shower curtain, 
water will flow from the bathtub into the bathroom floor. And the same thing actually happens with the abnormal mini colon. If this surrounding of inhibition is abnormal, stimuli from within the core of the mini colon will be able to suffuse to adjacent mini columns and form a cascade of, of uh, excitation. Um, probably another analogy is that of um, two cables, uh, two stranded copper cables. Um, uh, if you have an electrical circuit and uh, you see them together, if some of their insulation is actually peeled off, uh, you will see stimuli or the electricity from one cable coming to the other one. It forms a short circuit. And that is what happens with the mini columns in the brains of autistic individuals. You know, another way of actually trying to understand this is uh, by going back to uh, our physiology. Uh, usually neurons respond to a particular type of stimuli. And in this example, there will be one neuron that will start to fire whenever it sees a square wave. Whenever it sees a square wave, that neuron will fire a lot more frequently. Whenever that square wave is absent, it will seldom fire. Under pathological conditions, like in the cerebral cortex of the autistic individual, that neuron will actually fire when it shouldn't because it's heavily excited. And very soon in pathological conditions, it will be very difficult to differentiate what is signal from what is noise. In here, you can do it easily. In here, it's a lot more difficult. Uh, what uh, does this um, tell us about uh, what happens and, and the clinical expression of symptoms in uh, patients with autism if they have this defective shower of inhibition? Well, uh, this is from a book by John Rate, a very famous um, uh, a psychiatrist from uh, New York. And he has written several books. One of my favorites is The Shadow Syndromes. And he relates what happens to the brain and, and to the behavior of a normal individual that is bombarded by continual excitation, stimuli. And what he says is that it predisposes that, pe uh, that person to impaired functioning, to raise physiological stress, to internal chaos. It actually makes the individual partake in impulsive actions. And in the end, it actually causes the individual to develop a lower level of adaptation to life's challenges. Now, very importantly, um, because research shows that prolonged states of sensory overload are actually traumatizing, we can conclude that patients suffering from severe mental disorders are actually being traumatized by their own brains. And what that means is that we need to intervene early before these changes are hardwired to the cerebral cortex. The earlier you intervene, the better the results. Again, we're going back to the drawing by Janos Seth and Gothai. This is the mini column. Uh, this is the central compartment. And this is the peripheral compartment, the shower curtain of inhibition. This is where a lot of the deficit in autism is actually uh, located. And uh, this is a study that actually has, uh, investigated what type of inhibitory cells appear to be affected in autism. They did uh, staining uh, for the different types of inhibitory cells, those that are labeled with uh, parvalbumin, um, calretinin, and calbinding, and then plotted them uh, in XY coordinates uh, in different areas of the cortex in controls and in autistic individuals. Uh, you can see right here that those magenta color cells or interneurons, inhibitory cells, are the most predominant ones in the uh, cerebral cortex. Also, uh, just by looking at this, we could probably say that there are significant differences in terms of this uh, magenta-like staining cells. 
Now, uh, the researchers of this particular study, they went ahead and they counted uh, those magenta uh, looking cells, staining cells, and they found significant differences in all areas of the brain in which they examined for them, okay? And uh, this is actually highly, highly interesting and of great importance uh, to autism because this particular type of cell is responsible for the production of very high frequencies, brain waves, uh, which are called gamma oscillations. Why is this important? Well, uh, the brain is very similar to other systems for uh, communication, artificial, man-made systems of communication. And it's in the sense that the information capacity of these systems actually depends on the frequency and its bandwidth. And in the brain, the highest frequency is that of gamma. The largest bandwidth is that of gamma. So at this type of cell, the parvalbumin cells, the ones that were depicted as a magenta color in the cerebral cortex that appear to be abnormal in autism, they are responsible for processing the largest bulk of information uh, within the cerebral cortex. Uh, of importance to note, um, these gamma oscillations have been thought to play an important role in binding and central coherence. What do I mean by that? Binding is the ability to put different precepts of our sensory environment into a whole. It's the way by which we create a gestalt. Usually if we see a flower in a vase, that is a composite that is placed together out of the individual color of the uh, flower leaves of, of, of the texture that we may actually feel of the flower, uh, whether it has spines or not. Um, so, so it's a composite of all of them. And that appears to be impaired in autistic individuals. Uh, the same thing would actually happen, somebody looking at another person's face uh, the face would actually be a composite of, of the color of the hair, the eyebrows, of, of the symmetry of the face, of, of the way that person is frowning uh, the forehead or smiling. And it's only by putting all of those things together that we get a gestalt of somebody's face. And in autism, it's too much information. It's like looking at the sun at the patient's squint, and they only get to see a fraction of that information. So they actually lose a lot of the information within the surrounding. Another thing of importance for gamma oscillations is the fact that they have been associated with cognitive performance, okay? These are high, order cognitive functions, what we call executive functions, theory of mind, empathy, uh, joint attention, and so forth. Uh, all of those functions that appear to be affected in autism, uh, they are actually conveyed with uh, these gamma oscillations. And most importantly, repetitive TMS, transcranial magnetic uh, uh, stimulation, over a part of the prefrontal lobe can normalize these abnormalities of gamma oscillations. We know that from studies in other conditions. So the main thing here is why not we extrapolate what we have learned and actually do TMS in autism over this area of the brain that is supposed to normalize these gamma oscillations. So this leads me to the second part of my lecture about the how of TMS in autism. And I would like to start by stating what is Faraday's law because that's the principle by which TMS actually works. And basically, if you have a relative movement of a magnetic field on a conductor, uh, that conductor will have a change in electromotive force. It will develop a voltage. It will actually 
uh, develop a current. Uh, in the case of uh, autism, whenever we implement TMS, the machine has a one that creates the magnetic field. And the expansion of the field creates relative movement. Within the brain, we have anatomical elements in terms of axons, projections from neurons that take the place of a conductor. So having a magnetic field created by the wand of the TMS machine creates a magnetic field that influences conduction across these anatomical elements. And the idea behind TMS was to actually strengthen this shower curtain of inhibition uh, surrounding the core of mini columns. Uh, this was our first published article. Uh, we finished it in 2007, uh, made it electronically available in 2008, and finally published in print in 2009. And ever since, we have had some uh, 15 clinical trials with uh, several hundred patients. Uh, this was the results of the first uh, trial. And as you see from the very beginning, we emphasize a gamma frequencies as outcome measurements. This is a typical protocol uh, for autistic individuals. Um, uh, this is one of our patients, a very small, beautiful child. And uh, this is the reason why uh, we have been slow in developing um, appropriate treatments with uh, TMS. It's primarily because we follow a lot of principles in going as uh, slow and low as possible uh, because uh, children are precious and, and uh, we wouldn't like to have uh, any side effects. We use uh, very low frequencies because low frequencies tend to be selective for inhibitory elements. And by stimulating inhibitory elements, we actually enhance the shower curtain of inhibition of mini columns. This is one of our study designs, uh, one of the latest ones. Uh, in here, we have taken 124 patients uh, for baseline observations and, and uh, procuring their diagnosis. Uh, from 124 patients, uh, we actually selected 112, which were randomized, and 106 finished the study. Uh, we had six dropouts, but it was primarily because uh, people were out of state and they had other urgencies to attend, but otherwise, we have never encountered any serious side effects with the therapy. However, in this particular study uh, that uh, some of them had six, 12, and 18 sessions, I, I just want to um, emphasize the fact that one study alone actually took us like 2,000 clinical visits. So it spanned the length of almost one year to do this single study. So they actually do take a long time and then you have to take them to the literature. Um, we like this approach because it actually makes our results empirically sound. Uh, we do not like other groups coming into the field and having or developing protocols and claiming positive effects without publishing those results, especially not being peer-reviewed. In our studies, and in the ones that I'm going to discuss, we use a Canisa illusory figure audible test. It's a series of um, illustrations, figures that come in, in a computer screen. Sometimes you can see that uh, this opposition of um, shapes actually provide or build up a geometrical figure, which is an illusion. It may be a square or a triangle, or it may be nothing at all. And what we tell our patients is that they have to click uh, with a mouse pad whenever they see, for example, a triangle and ignore the other stimuli. Uh, patients remain seated, they have a brain net. 
on them. Uh, we usually have to bring them several times to our laboratory in order to get a costume and desensitize. And I would like to state uh, for the record that um, our participants, they actually need to be alert. They need to cooperate, follow instructions, uh, be able to hold the net uh, for as long as the uh, study is going on. And for all of those reasons, uh, they are high-functioning individuals. Our results really apply to them. We do not have studies on lower-functioning patients. Uh, the illusory figures actually promote uh, gamma oscillations within the cerebral cortex that we can measure with EEG. In a normal individual, a neurotypical individual, whenever they see a target like the triangle with the Canisa figures, that creates a very high power within the cerebral cortex. Uh, otherwise, when the figures do not form any geometrical configuration, the power diminishes, and, and this is what happens normally. In autism, it really doesn't matter whether the figures form or do not form a geometrical uh, um, uh, picture. However, and this is the same uh, graph here, after TMS, okay, these were 16 sessions, you see how the power changes and it normalizes. And these are very significant uh, findings. The other thing that we have noticed is that initially, and, and this is uh, an illustration about brain mapping and connectivity in the brain of, uh, of uh, autistic individuals. This is the average uh, baseline for our patients you will see that a lot of the connectivity between different areas of the brain are short. There's only one long connection spanning across the hemisphere. But with TMS, six sessions, this connectivity actually increases. And by 12 sessions, it's actually very prominent. And there are many connections crisscrossing both hemispheres. It's normalizing. Uh, this is one of my favorite uh, results, but it's, it's a, a little bit difficult to explain. Uh, this is the x-axis, and it denotes a time lapse. Uh, it denotes with a zero uh, when did a patient notice uh, a mistake that they had committed, and then it measures uh, how long did it take for the patient to answer in his or her next trial. Usually what happens is that if, if you're a neurotypical individual and you commit a mistake, uh, the person will take longer on his or her next trial. So this curve here uh, is shifted towards the right side of the zero. In autistic individuals, however, once they make a mistake, they actually answer more rapidly on their next time around. And many people believe that's actually done because of the repetitive nature and impulsivity uh, of, of their condition, okay? Whenever uh, we do TMS, we see how that curve normalizes. This is the wait list controls. They were all autistic. They show the left side shift because they didn't receive the active treatment. The curve is, uh, uh, keeps itself on the left side of the zero value here, okay? We did some other measurements with um, event-related potentials. Uh, this is uh, the so-called error relativity uh, um, uh, related negativity wave. And um, it actually shows a shift in terms of the latency of the wave with TMS uh, that normalizes the same. This event-related potential has to do with impulsivity. It's present in conditions that have a lot of anxiety. And uh, we believe that TMS uh, could actually be a treatment for anxiety in autistic individuals. 
The results that we have found appear to vary with the number of sessions. This is the error rate with six, 12, and 18 sessions. And you see that there's almost like a linear uh, correlation in which participants do less and less mistakes. At the same time, the length of time or, or that happens in between their initial omission and answering in the next time around, it, it actually lengthens and also normalizes. Um, we have taken a lot of uh, autonomic measurements during our trials. Initially, they were a safety concerns. But then we found some very intriguing findings. And it was in the sense that many of our patients had dysregulation in their autonomic functions. You know, the autonomic uh, system controls for uh, those functions of the body that we do not think about them uh, consciously. And the sympathetic system is more like the accelerator of the car, while the brake is applied by the parasympathetic system. Initially, and this is from an EKG, uh, the RR interval uh, denotes the heart rate. And uh, the shorter the interval in here, the higher the heart rate. So these patients were practically tachycardic, and that tachycardia or high heart rate um, improved with treatment uh, with TMS. Also, uh, the amount of uh, variability in the heart rate was improved, and uh, that's actually of major benefit because um, uh, lack of variability predisposes an individual uh, to different heart disorders. Um, in here, some of our measurements were actually um, very interesting. Uh, that increased high rate of heart rate was caused by increased sympathetic system activation and over arousal of the sympathetic system. In here, you see skin conductance level, which is primarily mediated by the sympathetic system. Uh, and, and it's actually increased at the very beginning of, um, of our trial, and then it reduces itself considerably with TMS uh, therapy. Otherwise, the uh, parasympathetic tone initially is decreased but with TMS, it actually increases uh, with the total number of uh, treatment sessions. Uh, this is all translated into uh, behaviors, and we see that they have marked improvement with TMS on repetitive behaviors and aberrant behaviors, uh, which is of marked importance uh, for autistic individuals primarily because they are able to sit for longer period of times, they are able to listen and follow instructions. So they do a lot better at school. And many times uh, the people that notice uh, the major changes are when the patients go to school and then the teachers give us feedback. These changes uh, in behavior appear to be related to the total number of sessions. And in here, you can see the improvements from 12 to 18 uh, sessions. And uh, uh, you see that both in terms of repetitive and aberrant behaviors, there's improvement um, uh, with the number of sessions for TMS. Uh, right now, we have been trying to combine our treatment of TMS with needle feedback, primarily focusing on gamma oscillations. We have had a couple of publications, and we have found marked synergism between uh, the conditions uh, uh, by using the, the therapy together. 
And uh, I, I would like to uh, finish the lecture, but before doing so, uh, there has been a lot of publicity brought about to the use of TMS in autism. There's uh, a best-selling book by John Elder Robinson called uh, Switched On, and it relates his experiences with this particular therapy. Uh, John's experiences are quite sincere, and I'm very happy for them but they are not representative of what we have found in the general population of patients. Um, first of all, uh, our changes have been seen primarily in high-functioning individuals. They have been noticed only after multiple sessions. Uh, John actually noticed his changes after only one session, and they do not tend to last for for many years. Actually, the patients require booster sessions at the end of six months or maybe one year. Uh, we're counting with the plasticity of the brain to correct itself. And uh, in that regard, they may require booster sessions. Uh, it's just that after the first booster session, if it happened after one year, the patient may not need anything else for three or four years, who knows. Now, if anybody's interested in learning a little bit more about autism, uh, the pathology, what is happening in the brain, and the whys of TMS, um, we have a book that was just recently um, uh, released. It's called Defining Autism. You can read more about it. I also have my personal blog called Cortical Chauvinism, and I answer questions from uh, patients there. Uh, so you're welcome to uh, contact me, and I will be more than happy to learn from your questions. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you so much for uh, that great presentation today. We have a lot of questions, <laughs> as you can guess. So I'll just get started right away with the first one here. One is about safety. So, And you talked about this a bit during the talk. Um, mm -hmm. Do you want to say anything else about just safety studies or any kinds of, have there been any negative outcomes safety-wise from TMS? Well, the problem with negative outcomes is that if there are any, they haven't been reported, and that is one of the biases of the literature, that it will report on positive but not on negative findings. However, in regards to the safety of a TMS, there have been many studies, and they have approached the subject about safety in children. They have approached the subject not only in terms of the age bracket that we frequently use in our studies, but also in terms of the type of stimulation and uh, on the location of the stimulation. And to my knowledge, and in meta-analysis, it, it has been a fairly safe technique. Side effects primarily have been in terms of uh, muscle contractions over the site of the stimulation. So some people actually develop a headache, but uh, this is transitory. It's more of a tension headache and can be treated with over-the-counter medications. And again, uh, patients desensitize against the same uh, with multiple sessions of treatment. Uh, the other thing is uh, the noise of the machine. And what happens is that uh, we, if, if that bothers the patient at all, uh, we may provide for uh, earplugs. Uh, but otherwise, we haven't had any adverse experiences, and, and I am not aware of those within the literature. Uh, there was a concern primarily in regards to seizures, as many of our patients uh, have risk factors or do suffer from epilepsy, and some others uh, receive medications like neuroleptics that lower the seizure thresholds. Again, I am not aware of a single case of seizures related to TMS that has occurred with our protocol primarily using a lower frequency stimulation, which actually enhances inhibition. There have been reports, a dozen or, or, or more uh, seizures related to TMS use, but they have been primarily for higher frequencies. 
Well, this next question is about finding a provider. So if somebody lives in an area and they have a number of providers available, uh, one question is, are you aware of whether or not insurance frequently covers this? And the other is, how do you how do you know if it's a reputable provider? What's a great way to select somebody who has a lot of experience or is using an evidence-based approach? Uh, th those are great questions. Um, uh, TMS is uh, provided many times in, in the larger academic centers and those that have large departments of uh, psychiatry. It's a technique approved by the FDA for treatment of depression, uh, uh, drug refractory treatment of uh, people that suffer from major depression. Um, the only difference is, is that the protocols that we use and that are being used for depression are, are very different, but the machines are the same. So you can try checking into a major medical center and see if there's anybody pursuing TMS uh, and, and whether they actually do some autism. And uh, usually academic centers provide for reputable individuals. Um, um, I have never charged anything uh, to any of the patients participating in our studies. We have had hundreds and hundreds of patients, uh, thousands of uh, clinical visits, and we haven't charged a single set. Primarily, we have done this for research purposes. And because it's not approved by the FDA as of present, I don't think that I would see myself charging anybody. There are centers uh, that obviously they spend time, uh, they have to invest in terms of a machine, in, in terms of personnel. Um, if you want to receive treatment um, uh, privately, they will charge you money. Um, I would probably see whether any of those centers, if, if you are interested in pursuing um, that way, uh, whether they have published what is their protocols um, and what are the results, and um, try to prepare an appointment with them or anybody that you're considering, see whether they are knowledgeable uh, and, and whether they can answer your questions. Mm -hmm. All right, and we had one participant on the call who posted that TMS of NH.com is a reputable site. So that would be TMSOFNH.com. So that must be in the in New England area. So if people are, are listening in from there, that might be something to check out. Mm -hmm. uh, another question that we've got is, so you talked a little bit about um, university-based treatment and about private providers. Uh, People are asking about age ranges. So I know you talked a bit about your specific studies. Is this lifelong? Is there a sort of a threshold at the lower end? What what should be what should be observed there? That that's another great question. I, I really like all of the questions that we have received because they are very practical. I, I would have to say that from all of our published studies, all of the ones that we have done, as I said, there were like fifteen and several hundred uh patients, uh, 100 as active participants, and then other similar numbers from waitlist controls that were autistics serving as controls in our study, that after the end of the study, they went on to receive the therapy. So we have a lot of expertise in, in uh, this regard. Well, all of our patients have usually ranged from about eight years of age to 18, and that's primarily because uh, that is the age range where we can treat, treat uh, children and they can follow instructions and comply with uh, our outcome uh, measurements. Um, otherwise, we have expanded um, our treatments and we have had several children four or five years of age um, and, and we have noticed even better results than in our normal age bracket. And, and the thing to consider is that autism is a neurodevelopmental condition. Usually outcomes are better the earlier the intervention. And I do believe that that holds for TMS. 
okay? Uh, I haven't published those because they are not part of research uh, uh, protocols. Uh, but otherwise, that has been my general impression that the younger the child, the better the prognosis. The, the other thing is that, again, and, and I will reiterate, uh, our results hold for higher functioning individuals and, and in that regard, maybe uh, some lower functioning individuals, unfortunately, they may have a structural deficits, they may have uh, these heterotopias or, or dysplasias, malformation of the cerebral cortex, and it really doesn't matter how much uh, therapy you can do with the TMS, it won't fix the underlying structural deficit. So at least in some patients, um, there may be no benefit for this therapy. Okay. The next question, this person's asking a really specific question, but it leads a little bit to what you described about how you measured outcomes. They're asking about talking. So changes in speech with TMS, if it's been used in people, just people who would be considered, I suppose, you know, verbal, or if mm -hmm. you've seen testing on people with different abilities and how that looked. Yes, uh, I, I have never seen a change in a nonverbal individual with TMS becoming verbal. Um, I, I do have a series of uh, patients where I had some soft x-ray tissue done of their necks, and I found that for some autistic individuals, the larynx was displaced. So they didn't talk primarily because they couldn't talk, at, at least in that particular subgroup of uh, patients. And again, TMS won't actually change that. Uh, many of the findings are behavioral in nature. It's, it's the way the patients uh, behave and socialize. I, I had one patient, for example, who was a, a very nice kid. He was uh, intelligent, uh, high functioning, but he was completely asocial. And uh, after his sessions of TMS, uh, he came back to me and he had a girlfriend. And not only that, but he used to play chess by himself, but was very anxious in terms of facing other individuals. and. All of a sudden, he won his first uh, chess tournament. So he was uh, markedly excited. So I, I, I would say that it's in terms of comportment, their behavior, it's in, it's in terms of uh, social interactions, it's in regards to anxiety. Um, we have seen many changes in regards to the dysautonomia that I described in, in autism. Uh, it normalizes the imbalance in terms of their sympathetic, parasympathetic uh, uh, systems. And, and uh, you know, this actually would lead me into a tangent, but uh, you have to ask yourself, when is anxiety not anxiety? Uh, we treat patients with anxiety with uh, anxiolytics, and these are meant for short, uh, treatment verbs, uh, they have major side effects, they may even cause withdrawal. But TMS um, may be more proper because it actually targets the pathology of the condition. Uh, it, it may be better than any anxiolytic. And maybe by combining it with a beta blocker, both of them would actually tend to have synergistic effects. So we have noticed a lot of uh, improvement in our patients, and, and they across uh, a whole range of, of different uh, uh, behaviors. Um, I, I must say that many years ago, I, I was in, in uh, a meeting about TMS and autism, and, and one of the people in the audience, they asked me about the outcome measurements that we have done in our studies. Um, I started uh, reciting off the top of my head all of the different outcome measurements that we have used in terms of behavioral scales, ERPs, EEGs, and, and so forth. And it took me like five minutes. And, and we wanted to do that just to prove 
the point that there were benefits uh, to this therapy and, and that we could put a p-value. Uh, the other thing uh, that I would like to add is that many of these manifestations, when we talk all the way from gamma and binding phenomenon, how we put precepts together to uh, this autonomia and, and uh, behavioral manifestations, they are all linked. If you treat one, it's likely that you will get, get benefits in the other ones. They are all linked. They do not happen uh, together in this syndrome uh, by coincidence. Okay, so you talked a little bit about neurofeedback. What's the difference between TMS and neurofeedback? Well, uh, TMS works uh, by uh, the Faraday uh, law uh, in, in the sense that a stimulation induces uh, a voltage, uh, a current within the cerebral cortex. It's powerful enough to actually do that. Uh, we know the mechanisms by which it works, which is Faraday law, but we are a little bit sketchy, nebulous, in terms of how it's translated into its biology. How does it work biologically wise? Uh, neurofeedback, on, on the other hand, we have even less in, in terms of uh, information about how it works. Um, usually what we do is that we see that patient in, in a, a front of a screen, uh, they have some electrodes in, in their head, they are able to monitor uh, the brainwave information coming from them, and uh, we put like a picture, a movie of uh, animals, uh, zoo animals, uh, which they are very interested. If they develop the proper brainwave, that picture will be seen in the whole screen. But if they are not at the proper brain wave, then that picture collapses and it's very small. So it's up to the individual to make that picture large. And it, it takes a lot of trials to develop appropriate uh, neurofeedback. Usually the more is better. And most people would actually say that you need about 40 sessions before you see uh, positive effects. With TMS, we can see positive effects um, uh, after like 12 sessions. So I've had a few questions about self-injury and about improvements, both like people who are sharing their stories that they've seen improvement in their loved ones or, or in themselves. Uh, one question was specifically about self-injury. Have you seen any specific data on improvements or changes with PMS for SIB? Um, I, I haven't seen data specifically uh, for maladaptive uh, and self-injurious uh, treatment, but there is a lot of information about aberrant behaviors and about repetitive uh, measures. Um, and there have been improvements in them, yes. Okay, one last question. I know we're almost out of time. Somebody's asking about home PMS equipment so this would be doing this by yourself at home without a without a professional or an expert uh, yes um, if, if you actually go through uh, YouTube uh, there's a large uh, DIY community uh, makers community do it yourself DIY and uh, in, in some cases they even discuss how to build uh, TMS equipment and uh, portable ones are being done in the United States, but it's primarily for the treatment of migraines. Uh, and it's very specific in, in terms of how you can apply the same. Uh, outside of the US, that's uh, a lot more common. And, and there are many different generations of similar machines in, in China, uh, specifically. Um, I, I would say that if you have autism, to shy away from using TMS uh, on your own at home, uh, this is a serious technique that has serious physiological effects. Um, uh, you can actually see the effects when you go over a muscle and that uh, you can uh, stimulate the same to contract with the uh, use of TMS. 
uh, you may be in the wrong area, uh, you may be using the uh, different protocol, uh, you may end up actually worsening the condition more than improving the same. And especially in a patient population that is prone to seizures uh, that may be at risk because of the medications that they are taking, uh, this is really not at all advisable.